Hello, good day. This is Thomas with LibertarianProgressive.com, BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel, where we interview independent third party candidates who are going to be on the ballot um, and uh, who are the only third option in their district. And today we're going to do an interview with uh, Stephen Spoonamore, um, who's an independent for running for the Ohio House in district number one. And um, I should be calling in any time. If you haven't checked out our previous interviews, you can go to libertarianprogressive.com and you'll see interviews with people running for the U.S. House, for Attorney General, for Senate, and um, and also some state legislator uh, districts as well. And um, so people say, oh, well, there's, I mean, I bet if you looked at the statistics, probably about 99.9% of all uh, candidates that are in office are Republicans and Democrats. And, um, but, you know, maybe there might be some more competition in the future. And it looks like Stephen's just calling in here. And uh, is this Stephen? It is. Hi. Hey, good to talk to you today. And uh, so if people can check out more information at stephenspoonamore.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, S-P-O-O-N-A-M-O-R-E dot com. And uh, so, Stephen, good afternoon and um, happy Wednesday to you. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. If you could tell us, um, we'll just start out with, uh, you know, what's your platform? What's your message? Why are you running? Um, you, know, you know, what are the issues that uh, you're going to bring to the Ohio State Legislature as an independent, sir? Well, first, thank you so much for uh, reaching out to uh, to have a good yak with uh, somebody who thinks he's somewhere between libertarian and progressive. So that's great. And um, and hello to all your listeners. Um, my background is a, as a businessman. I've never run for public office before, but I, I've built 14 companies. I'm pretty well established in the technology field. And a lot of my uh, products and, and processes have been involved with either uh, advancing electronic security systems or advanced materials. So very science-based, um, very uh, uh, leading um, patent-driven companies. And um, early venture stage, I, I, I've actually raised 17 different rounds of venture capital. So I understand that world. And I would often be involved in meetings, development meetings, where you would have uh, elected officials and, uh, and their designees, and you would functionally have some version of, I can't read a spreadsheet, I'm not a scientist. You know, I, it, 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 it was a frustrating conversation frequently. And I, um, three years ago, uh, was uh, reading the letters between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, uh, after they both retired from the presidency, and they had and been you know, bitter enemies when they had run for the president against each other three times. And I, I was amazed by the depth and thoughtfulness of these letters and the fact that two of them had both landed on one fundamental problem they hadn't thought through when they set up the country, and that was the two-party system was taking over. And they laid out that all of the good people, the people that accomplished things in their community, were no longer running, that the parties were basically getting people low-level jobs and using the leverage of that to get them the next job and then the leverage of that to get them the next job. And it became a promotional chain based on a form of corruption, um, which is a party-based corruption. And, and I read this, and I sort of looked up, and I thought, huh. And I talked about it with some people, and several people said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, it's not me who, and it's not now when. So I was thinking about that fact when I looked at the newspaper in December of last year, 2015, and, and realized that a person that I really thought was not suited for the office of county commissioner was the likely GOP nominee to take over for a term-limited um, gentleman who was stepping down as our state representative. And I made note of two people who I thought were supposed to be running were not even there. And I called them and said to my colleagues who I respect and thought would be running for this office, I said, 
what happened. And they said, well, the party doesn't want us to run, and it's, you know, his turn, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's within the GOP. Locally, the Democratic Party really sometimes doesn't even put someone up. They are, um, we have a very heavily Republican district. And I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to try this, now is the time. And so I went about the very difficult task of filing as independent. And it's been, I, I would say, a fascinating process. So that's the background. And then from a platform perspective, I want to bring the sort of rational, science-based decision-making that leads to prudent investment, high value in return, and durable outcomes. And I don't think that decision-making process is frequently involved in government spending, and that's what I would like to bring to the table. How's that? Awesome. Yeah, no, that's good, and that's very interesting, a good way to start this off. And uh, so I have a list of um, topics, and you can answer them however you want. Um, you, you know, right. you might be inspired to answer it one way, someone else might be inspired another way, but I'd like to hear your specific views on these topics. Um, all right, so let's just start with um, – uh, and just spend like maybe just a minute or two on them. Uh, how about accountability and transparency? I'm a big fan of accountability and transparency. And uh, we've had a, it's, in fact, my race here in the county has sort of become about that. Uh, the Republican Party has done a lot of machinations. They've tried to knock me off the ballot multiple times with uh, both, they fired the chair of the Board of Elections, which they had the right to do, and put in a partisan who then, voted to stop my campaign, then there was a lawsuit, and I got back on the ballot, then they attempted to appeal it and throw me off, and now they're attempting a second appeal to throw me off. And there's an enormous question now. My lawyers estimate that they've spent close to $80,000 of public money trying to keep me off the ballot. And the oh. only thing the prosecutor would say is it's, it's just been a few hours of my time and a few hours of my staff's time and, it, you know, a few hundred dollars, and, and we're looking at these 30, 40, 50-page briefs, seven, eight days in court, the court time, it's, I think it's atrocious. Um, yep. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you bring transparency uh, to organizations like parties. They're very difficult to penetrate and, um, and really have written rules certainly in terms of ballot access in which they really don't have to be transparent. Um, it's, it's tragic. Yeah. Why not let the voters decide who is um, going to be uh, on the ballot or, or elected or not? Well, what about, um, we'll just well, segue into, it, it, um, just, oh, just go in ahead. Ohio, just to, and just, just to understand in Ohio, and, and this is true in many other states, the rules, the two parties agree on one thing. Don't make it really hard for an independent to get on the ballot. We don't like that idea. So in Ohio, uh, a Republican or a Democrat filing for their independent needs 25 electors who are qualified to sign a petition to get on the ballot. To be on the ballot as an independent, you need to gather at least 10 times uh, that, and in most cases, 25 to 30 times because it's a formula. Your jurisdiction, total number of voters who turned out in your jurisdiction for the last statewide race for president or governor times 1%. So in my case, I had to get close to a thousand signatures just to file to appear on the ballot. Wow! And what kind of reform so do you think? That's just to start the be, process. What's that? What kind of reform could um, you think might be useful in the election system? Well, I, I'm a I'm a a long advocate of uh, of paper ballots, and I actually have been a a, a long proponent of looking at um, a first two to finish process. And California is now, after a couple election cycles, proving this actually creates better races, more centrist candidates, people willing to compromise more. So you have you know, races in California that two Democrats are the top two. You have one race or two Republicans are the top two. Why? Because they're the two that sort of spoke to the largest bulk in the middle. And uh, I actually think that top two to finish, as opposed to each party gets to pick one, is a much superior way to have the primaries. It basically says every citizen should turn out for the primary. Every citizen should vote for the primary. 
whoever the top two people within or top three in the Colorado proposals for the top three in any in district to then appear on the ballot and then you know then it's winner take all and yes your party can support you but the real power of the party is that gatekeeping process that they get to pick one of the two names that will get priority if that gatekeeping process is taken away and given back to the voters with top two and top three finished primaries the parties have to get out and work. They have to turn out their voters, but they no longer have a gatekeeping function as to who appears. And that, I think, would be a huge positive blessing for our democracy. Yeah, and that's interesting to think about. Um, Washington State also has that system as well. There's like two or three states that do. We actually just talked to um, someone yesterday who's a libertarian running as for attorney general against a Democrat, and it's just him and, and one other person running for attorney general in the state of Washington. Um, what about um, – uh, so that that would be a, a definite reform uh, that could be interesting. What about um, What about the topic of small and mid-sized businesses? Well, I'm a that that's my. I mean, I don't even know where to start with uh, with how to answer that. My my expertise is growing those, and there are certain things which I've seen governments do and do very well. One, I'm a deep believer. You will never get small businesses able to do what I call deep innovation without some kind of subsidized approach. Now, sometimes. You know, men of great wealth do that. In the in the Carnegies of the world, famously did it. Bill Gates does it, and there's certain investors that that do that. But even most investors that think that way really are thinking at most on a four quarter, maybe an eight or twelve quarter basis before they're expecting to see how is this productized. One of the great things that I believe the United States government has done is set aside within many agencies what's called SBIR innovation research grants. So small business innovation research grants, you have to be fairly small, you know, less than 50 people and sometimes less than 100 in some cases. You have to have something that's patent-based. You have to actually have a specification from be it the National Science Foundation or Department of Energy or Department of Agriculture or one of the agencies in the DOD that says, hey, we really don't know how, how an advanced absorbent reactive material would work in a highly volatilized environment. But if there was such a product out there, then we would have it used in these form of soldier protections or these form of worker protections. And is anyone out there working on this? So then I bring that up as an example because that was something that was posted, and that was an area that, that I had a company in advanced materials with expertise in. We saw that. We said, wow, we've really wanted to put a two-year effort into trying to modify our materials to, to provide what's called toluene protection for workers that make paints and work in confined spaces. Like how do you paint the inside of a tank to keep it from rusting when that tank is normally full of all the gases? So well, you basically – have a more dangerous environment that you have to go into than if you're deep sea diving. And you have to use these very complicated respiration and protection systems. And we thought that our material could be modified to make that safer, but it's a two-year process. And do we, can we fund that as a, as a 35-person company you know, delivering for our customers? No, not likely. But we applied for an SBI or innovation grant won the phase one of it, which are always very small. It's just fifty or $100,000 to say, great, do a proof of concept test. And if you pass that, then you come back and apply for phase two, which can be a quarter million or a half million, which allows you to build a prototype. And if that works and the prototype, it's, the customers actually look at the prototype and say, yes, we would take a small order, then the final phase, the phase three of an SBIR, allows you to do that. And the reason I bring this up, from an economic development perspective, if you look at the great breakthroughs, Google – came about on an SBIR grant. That's what they actually, that's the little chunk of money they had. They said, wow, we think we can make an algorithm make these preferences. There was a, a need within one of the DOD agencies saying, hey, we'd really like if someone could prioritize the way these websites, so we don't have to look at them all. How could we prioritize them? They applied for that, and that's what led to the ability to take the algorithms they had developed in the lab at Stanford and say, look, we have a prototype. And then, you know, 
then venture capitalists can look at it, and you're no longer talking about a theory or paper or bench. You've got something from the talk about. Now, I bring it up, state governments. Our state does not involve itself in SBIRs. They just say, wonderful, nice job, Mr. Spoonamore, your company won another SBIR, hullabaloo. But some states, like Kentucky, turn around and say, rather than giving our economic development money to some big company as a sort of shakedown so they don't leave, we will, for every dollar you win an SBIR, we'll just throw in an extra buck or another 50 cents. And that sort of acceleration thing, it's a very competitive process to win the SBIR. Then once you've won that SBIR, this, the state simply says, hey, you're here, you're doing innovation research here, you've clearly passed the barrier and gotten through the hurdles and made all the checks and done all the stuff to get these agencies to agree that you have a worthwhile project, you know, we'll meet you buck for buck. That goes a huge way. And I actually know small companies now, friends and colleagues of mine, that are looking to cite their next projects in jurisdictions that do that. And I will be, you know, in the state house advocating that Ohio pick up a, pick up a similar program. It's just states who have modeled it. We just have to do it. That was very interesting. And what about um, education? Okay, I'm a I'm a huge believer in uh, public education, and I'm a product of public education, and I am extremely distressed at the lack of oversight and this sort of ungoverned privatization money that's flowing out. If it's public money, it needs public oversight. I'm a, a great private schools are great. Go to a private school. My brother went to a private school. You pay your money, you go to a private school, and I am a supporter of that. If it's a public school and it's public tax money, it needs to flow through an accountability board that's elected by the public. And so the charter school movement really began with, with local teachers and local parents saying, hey, we think we could do better at this with, with a program that's a focused on magnet students who are in the arts and how it integrates with the rest of their lives. Fabulous. I love that that's how it started. But what it's become since then is that these charter schools are template models that are now being run by some of the very same people that have these horrible corrupt technology groups like IPT that just went bankrupt and Corinthian. It's the same guys, the same investors, the same managers. They're just rubbing their hands together saying, wow, we've got these billion-dollar pots of public money. Nobody's accountable to it. They can just run it through our management company. We'll hire the cheapest teachers we can. I mean, here in Ohio, we have this terrible situation with this school called ECOT, the Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow. Well, they convinced about mm, 10,000 parents to sign up their kids for this online school. Yes, there's been a few success stories within it, but there's also three or 4,000 kids that never log on to this online school but they're charging the state for all of the money associated with this and taken out of the district's money. It's outrageous. And the state finally, after doing some spot audits, basically turned around and said, you know, you're billing us for 100 students right now, and there's actually only six online. And what are those other 94 doing? So uh, they're now locked up in a lawsuit where the ECOT people, also some of the same investors in Corinthian, which also went bankrupt, um, are saying, we don't have to give you those records. No way. We're a private company. Well, yes, you're a private company. Last year received $132 million in public money from the state of Ohio, taxpayer money, that nobody seems to be able to account for what you did with it, how many students were taught, who was online, where are the assets now. It's, it's terrible. If you're going to have public funds, it needs public oversight. If you want to have private funds, great. Mazel tov. Do what you want. Right? That's my take. All right. Well, it looks like there's some room for reform in education, the education system. What about, um, let's go into taxes a little bit. What would be um, your stance on the current state of taxes in your states and, and maybe um, is uh, and, and maybe expand into maybe property taxes. Is there any th reforms that need to be done there or is it good the way it is? You know, I, I struggle with exactly – Ohio has put itself into a strange bind. We, we have a sort of a unique situation. I actually thought 
uh, as Kasich came in office, um, that we actually were in a pretty good place. We had middle-of-the-range property taxes nationwide, but we were sort of on the middle-upper range for what we got for it. We got very good public services, very good schools. Back in the 70s, when the state added a statewide sales tax, there was this agreement in place that the state would collect the sales tax, and then they'd redistribute that money down to cities and townships and counties in a formula that remained unchanged until Kasich came in. So for every dollar that came in, there was X number of pennies went to each different constituency. Kasich came into office here in Ohio, and this goes back to the the, 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 the party perpetual promotion. He really ran for governor solely to be a platform to run for president. He really did. I mean, he the day after... The day after he swore in as governor, he left for New Hampshire to start giving stump speeches. There's a I'm not making stone. that up. Correct. And his, the entire last year before he dropped out of the presidency, he was out of our state 228 days. So, you know, but in order to run for president, he needed a platform. So he came in, and his platform was going to be, look, I balanced Ohio's budget. Well... Ohio had a problem in that it was running, it was burning its rainy day fund at a slow rate, but it was burning it. And nobody wanted to touch how to deal with why it was burning it. And Kasich just made a decision, I'm going to give less money from the sales taxes to the local jurisdictions. Okay, well, the consequence of that was twofold. He, as now a governor, in one year I balanced the budget and rebuilt the rainy day fund. That's true. I mean, from a state perspective, but he robbed Peter to pay Paul. In doing that, the the little city I live, I live in the 11th largest city in Ohio. It's called Worcester. Not very big. Nobody knows where it is, although if you drive a Volkswagen, your powertrain and transmission was built here, okay? And if you eat a Frito chip today and you're in the Northeast, it was made in Worcester, Ohio. We have the largest oh, Frito plant in the Northeast. So, or, or the other thing is Daisy. People know Daisy brand sour, sour, cheese, sour cream and cottage cheese. That's made here, too. So we have some big industry people, but not a lot of people know where Worcester is. So we're, we're located about an hour south of Cleveland, great little city great community, smart business community. Worcester basically took a 9% hit on its city budget, and our county took a 16% hit on their county budget. The second week that Kasich's in office, they said, I'm no longer going to share the money on sales tax the way the agreement is. I'm going to keep it here to balance the state budget and rebuild the rainy day fund. Okay, what does the city and the county then do? Right? So the city and the county, yeah, are all of a sudden looking at 10 and 20% holes blown in their budget because this long-standing agreement that allowed the sales tax to be put in place was suddenly changed, and they had to make a decision. Worcester, my little community, decided we have a small, a tiny uh, additional sales tax that we put on for our parks and schools, and we voted to raise our own taxes on ourselves in our city by half a percent to cover what the state was no longer sending us. But the county and the townships around us didn't have that option. And they're hurting. They're, there's now four years of deferred bridge maintenance, four years of deferred road maintenance. So I, I'm, I'm a believer in efficient, appropriate, thoughtful, and durable investment. You think through your money. You think what you have to do. And government really does have a place in infrastructure. And right now, both federally and from an Ohio state level and here at our county level, we're not funding our infrastructure in the manner that our ancestors did. We're driving around on an interstate system that thankfully our grandfathers and grandmothers paid to build. We're now letting them crumble. And it's silly. We should make a decision, and it's a tough decision. You have to step back and say, are there things that we really need and want? And if there are, let's think through prudent ways to make a systematic investment in them, and then let's convince the people why we're doing it. And and certainly here in Worcester, we have a great mayor. We have a great city council. 
and they turned around and said, hey, you know, we have, if we if we are going to deal with this, it means closing one of our three city pools. Do we want to do that? It means potentially closing a couple of our parks. It means not doing the road maintenance we normally do. It means not doing the replacement on our on our police and fire station, which was planned. And the community scratched our heads and basically said, no, nah, we, yeah, we still want to do that. So we went ahead and voted to tax ourselves because we knew what we were spending it on. I think one of the big problems with the big question of taxes, people like to jump up and down and say, I'm against taxes, I'll cut them. And I'm like, yeah, and then what happens? It's like, I want to know what you're spending it on. Tell me tell me where the money is going. Let's have a, a rich and clear public dialogue. And I'll give big props to state level in Ohio. We have this interesting cat named Josh Mendel, and he's functionally created this thing called Ohio Checkbook. And I encourage your listeners to go look at it. He's basically forced, literally, sometimes, sometimes it sounds like at gunpoint the way it's presented in the press, he's showing up and demanding major agencies put their books online. He's going, look, just put them online. He says, eventually it all comes out. Just put them online. I want a monthly checkbook. I want the public to actually look at the checkbook. And it's fascinating. I spend a lot of time looking at them. And it does. It changes your behavior. You're able to then turn around and say to people, anyone who wants to rage against taxes, and I meet those people a lot, I go, I appreciate that, I think that's great, and how do you want the road paid for? And they're like, well, um, somebody should do it. I'm like, right, we do it. It's our money. So let's look at what we're spending it on, decide what's appropriate, and then do it and make smart investments about it. Yeah, that might make some people feel like they're under a little more uh, sc- scrutiny, at least. Um, so I just have four more topics here, and, and, and the last one yeah. will be asking you if there's any events and, and things like that. But just to um, expand the issues here, what about um, the environment, uh, kind of like a quality of life, uh, w- water quality, the uh, air, et cetera? What, um, you know, what, how would you approach the environment for the state of Ohio? Yeah, no, that's, thank you. And, um, uh, again, issue I have a, a, a massive paper trail and electronic trail about. So about half of the companies I've built have been in what I consider the uh, green technology space. And we have been involved with innovations to improve water technology, um, especially the recapture, reuse, and reduction of agricultural chemicals so they don't get into drinking water supplies and groundwater. I've been involved in the actual remediation of toxic plumes and cleanup of Superfund sites. Uh, and in addition, um, two of my earlier companies entirely built electronic monitoring and control systems with a focus on the energy efficiency and the conversion of what was at that time very heavily continuous run analog and high heat units to um, digital switching. So we would oftentimes sit with a customer and say, Yes, this is a $2 million investment, and it's going to make you more efficient, but the thing that you may not be thinking about right now is it's also going to reduce your air conditioning bill by about $450 a month and your electrical bill by $200 a month. And when you start doing the math on that times, you know, the 44 or 50 months of the unit, all of a sudden they go, oh, well, okay. So I've knocked another 150000 off the savings. And you start getting into these interesting discussions that what energy efficiency does to the bottom line. And those are, those are real numbers. You're talking about 12, 15, 20, sometimes even 40% of some investments really in the end are an energy balance question. So I'm, a, I'm an absolute science-based person. We have a huge problem with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at this point. We need to create a glide path to get to a zero carbon or close to a zero carbon discharge environment. Um, if we don't, we're really we are headed into the unknown from a thermal from a thermal retention perspective now. But the question is, how fast and how far do we want to go? And um, I'm unafraid of the fact that that's it. I think that's a huge exciting possibility. There's going to be big financial winners and losers. Um, right now, you basically hear from a lot of people that get panicky about it on both sides, and you don't get to hear from a lot of business people who sit there going, this is a huge opportunity. I mean, 
the guys at Solar City and Tesla and stuff, they're making it into a business opportunity and doing very well with it. And I think that there's huge unseen and fascinating business combinations that come out of the conversion to a, a cleaner discharge economy. And I, and let's face it, from basic libertarian perspective, I hate free riders. It's like we had just outside of Worcester a big coal fire power plant. It's now gone. And, and, you know, when the thing would fire up, you'd know. It's like it, it, air quality was lower. It's like people were wheezing. And asthma. It's like they don't pay anything for that. And, um, hey, you know, the free, rider, the free rider is always a problem. And the free rider who is entrenched, because I already own this asset and why should I give it up and it's not my problem that it's hurting other people, um, yeah, you've got to address it. So I view the opportunity to convert to uh, a low-carbon or zero-carbon future as a huge business opportunity, and the people that embrace that first and win in that area are going to own the energy and uh, systems technology of the future. And we're behind. The U.S. is way behind now. Yeah, yeah, it'll help us be more competitive as well. Um, now, what about, um, let's just hear some of your thoughts on uh, just the, I can break it into two sections here, the justice system in general, and also um, uh, like medical marijuana. Do you think that should be a criminal justice issue, a health issue, something else? No. Yeah, legalize it. So, yeah. I'm a legalizer guy. I, I, just don't, I, just don't, I just don't see the point of criminalizing, I mean, have you alcohol? I know people who use a lot of alcohol. I know people who use a lot of weed. I'm considerably more scared of the effect of alcohol than I am of weed. And it's like, it's a soft drug. We'll just legalize it and tax it. I, I love the model that Colorado's following. They're learning a lot out there. There's lots of states following along now. And I, I just think that's inevitable. Um, and to me, and, and that's and, and I've had that opinion for 20 years. It's never made sense to me. It's like all all you're doing is funding criminals by criminalizing it. So um, on, the, on the criminal justice on a broader sense, I, I'm not the smartest guy in this area. And, I, and I, I, I give a shout out to another local candidate, David Kiefer. He's running for county commissioner. He's really smart on criminal justice and transition issues locally. He kind of schooled me on some of the things that are working and not working locally. And um, I, I have, I always was suspicious of the for-profit criminal industry because functionally, I know that the most important thing for me when I'm running a company, and I've run a lot of them, is keeping my customers. And if the if prisoners are my customers, then <laughs> I don't necessarily want to reform them. My goal is to keep them incarcerated so I can keep getting paid. Um, the incentives never seem to be intelligent for privatizing prisons to me. And you don't... And having now heard uh, to face with a bunch of people who've been through the system through Dave Kiefer and working with him, no, that that pro- that part of the process is broken. Um, we need to take the incentive out of keeping people criminalized. The incentive needs to be: How do you take someone who's made a tragic mistake or even multiple tragic mistakes? How do you reintegrate them in society? Eventually, you've got to do it. It's hard work. There's places in the world where it's done really well. There's good models out there. And, you know, we're a, a multi-billion dollar model of how to lock up 2% of your population. And that's, uh, that's astounding. That's, it's astounding to me when I look at the numbers. And I'd, mm, I'd like to see, as a first step in Ohio, I will certainly support any effort to remove the private prison incentive to keep people locked up. Yeah, and that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, as like you said, science based, and also um, you know, see what the incentive trail is. And um, and uh, now I was going to ask you, who are some of your favorite people, past or present, elected or not? I think you already mentioned Jefferson and, and Adams, so that was a very interesting how you started off the uh, conversation today. Um, what about? Um, any issues that I might not have touched on, and also what are some of the um, upcoming events that you're going to have today, or, or you know, in the future, Stephen? 
Uh, well, I, I'd certainly throw a couple of additional names in there, people who, who I deeply admire. That um, uh, So there, there's sure. a, a man named John Boyd, and uh, he's sort of famous for the development of what's called the OODA loop, the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And he, famous, he was a fighter pilot. We, our fighter pilots started getting not as not as productive, and he sort of innovated the OODA loop to to create a disciplined way of making decision processes. Um, it's affected Marine Corps strategy, major agency strategy. Um, I actually got to meet uh, Colonel Boyd toward the end of his life. Uh, had, had read his works already, and um, and, and subsequently books have come out, longer books after it came out after his death, actually about what his thought process like. I have to give credit because I, I sort of I adopted it years ago in the '80s, and uh, and I still to this day just, I, I run OODA loops. I sit there going, okay, observe, orient, decide, act, and then reobserve, orient, decide, act, and just be very simple about it. Don't. Don't overcomplicate the situation. Just stay in the noodle loop. Two, um, probably the single most important figure uh, from a biographical perspective, and I don't know quite why, but I, I read Titan, the biography of Rockefeller, when I was uh, well, a number of years ago now, probably 25 years ago. And his thought process of why you build a company how you decide where to innovate within a company, and how you orient yourself to give back to society deeply affected me. And I, I've returned and read that book twice since, and, um, and uh, you know, props where props is due. And of, of, the, of the big founders, yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually sort of an Adams man more than a Jefferson man. I, I find some of what Jefferson did, I, I guess the correct term, I think he was a strategic genius, but he was politically a little oily. Um, and uh, I think John Adams was not particularly strategically genius, but he was absolutely upfront about where he stood and everything. So I guess they needed each other. Uh, their, their, their letter exchange is certainly fascinating if your readers don't know it. And then I, I don't know that there's any – you've covered a lot of great topics. I, 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 I'm not thinking of any particular one I, I'd want to touch on, but in terms of if there's people uh, listening locally, um, the College of Worcester, which is a, a – a wonderful, amazing research-based undergraduate school. They're having a candidates forum, which I'll be a part of on October the 4th. And unfortunately, the League of Women Voters um, had a debate scheduled for October the 11th, and uh, all of the Republican candidates have declined to attend, So they, uh, which is a strategy they're using in a lot of places. Now, they just refuse to attend League of Women Devo Voters debates if they don't want to appear in public, and um, so the public doesn't have to see them. So... Wow, yeah. well, I guess they but they I, forfeit by technical knockout then, don't they? <laughs> well, their, their theory is that they have nothing to gain. They're, this is an R plus 16 district. I, my opponent is, is calculating that, um, that you know, he'll still win by three or four points. He, instead, of, instead of a plus 16, he'll end up with a plus three, four. I'll, I'll only be able to knock off 10 or 12 points off of his uh, expected win. Um, and he's right. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm out there every day. I, 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 was, I was putting in yard signs and meeting supporters right up until this phone call, and I'll be doing it again as soon as I'm done. Your hat's in the ring, and, and so we do wish you good luck in your campaign, and so people can ch check out your website um, to get more information, stephenspoonamore.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-P-O-O-N-O-R-E.com. And thank you for taking and the I time would, today. I yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. And, and, and the last thing, there, there's actually a pretty active and, and, and very fascinating set of exchanges on Facebook. And that's Stephen mm -hmm. R. Spoonamore. My middle name is Russell, but it's spelled the same way, S-P-E-P-H-E-N-R Spoonamore, S-P-O-O-N-A-M-O-R-E on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, there's been a lot of dialogue about the Republicans refusing to attend the League of Women Voters and uh, the fact that the husband of our local county commissioneress has called me a cockroach in public because I keep calling them out on their refusal to disclose how much they're spending to corrupt the ballot. So um, it's been interesting. It's been a, it's been a learning curve. They, they keep, what's fascinating is they, they really act like a, they, they've been in power for 25 years. They sort of expect coronations. Whoever they pick in their primary has won for the last 25 years. 
and they haven't had a substantial challenge from somebody, A, who's well-funded, and B, who's just flat-out aggressive. And uh, I feel like every time I find a new way to campaign, they all run to their collective fainting couches and start crying. But we don't do things like that here. A simple example. I thought I love football and I love baseball, and it was opening of football season here at the high schools. So I printed up high school football schedules for every team with their primary rivalry on a flip side, and then every one of them ends the, the last week of football the week before the election, so the last game is vote score no more. And then I have some stuff about my campaign plus their logos, and I send volunteers to every home opener of every game in my district, and we're passing out these schedules and asking to vote score no more. Oh, my gosh, you would think that I had murdered Jesus. It was, uh, you know, how dare you, you know, campaign at a football game. And I'm sitting going, meanwhile, I had hundreds of people sending me going, thank you, man, you're the first not useless politician. This is great. Schedules are great. The rivalry stuff is great. The facts on them are great. (laughs) But, yeah. The Republicans all ran to their fainting couch and said, you can't do that. And I'm like, I, know, I don't know where the rule is that I can't pass out football schedules for free. And so I think most of the football fans liked it. So, <laughs> Well, we right. appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today to enlighten our audience about um, different options that are out there. And, uh, and I definitely admire you for running for office for the right reasons to help represent your district. Uh, that does... You know that that's um, you know someone putting their um, time and efforts out as for service for the people, and so we appreciate you taking the time very very much, Stephen. Thanks so much. Uh, well, Thomas, it's, it's great. Yeah.